Today, we are going to talk about the discount rates for real estate valuation. As was concluded in a previous presentation, only rarely the CAPM is used today for property valuation. The reason is the difficulties of estimating beta. First, because we said property markets are not operationally efficient. And second, because properties carry many risks which cannot be quantified simply by using volatility. So for this reason, in general, practitioners do not use the CAPM to determine the discount rate to be applied for evaluation uh, of a property. Since public information is available only on gross yields, the common practice is to, do, to use these gross yields as a vehicle for to determining the discount rate for income properties. This is the topic of this presentation. The devaluation of development projects will be covered in a future video. Let's start talking about the gross yield. The gross yield is simply the return associated with the rent, assuming that the rent behaves as a perpetuity. And there are two possible interpretations. The first case is the case of a constant perpetuity and the other is a growing perpetuity. In the case of a constant perpetuity, we are assuming that the rent stays constant forever. So the value of the property is given by simply dividing this rent by the yield. In the case of the growing perpetuity, the value of the property is obtained by dividing the rent, in this case the rent for the first year, by the difference between the discount rate R and the growth rate G. The growth rate is a growth rate that we assume that the rent will have in the future forever. So we define IGP, which is the numerator in these formulas, as the first year's estimated potential gross income. Well, in the case of the constant perpetuity, is the potential gross income forever. Uh, only in the case of the growing perpetuity, we are talking about the first year's potential gross income. Y is the gross yield, R is the implied discount rate, and G is the growth rate, as we said before. The growth rate is usually assumed to be equal to the consumer, consumer price index under the assumption that the rent can be adjusted uh, with inflation year after year. Note that if we assume a growing perpetuity, then the yield is equal to the discount rate R minus G. Or you can also think that the discount rate R will be the yield plus the growth rate. The general practice is for analysts to use the discount rate implicit in the gross yield, the rate R, to discount property free cash flows after taxes. However, these free cash flows are formed not only by rents, but include expenses and investments as well. Gross yields are consistent with rent cash flow because gross yields are computed from rents but expenses and investments are much less risky cash flow. So the gross yield implied rate is not appropriate to discount free cash flows, in our opinion. The obvious solution is to group cash flows into similar risk streams and then discount each stream at its corresponding rate according to its risk. Well, let's start by identifying the components of an income property's free cash flow. First, let's look at the structure of the income statement of an unlevered income property. Well, it is composed in the following way. First, we have gross potential income, which is the potential rent of the property, assuming no vacancies or collection losses. Then we subtract the losses that include vacancies, collection losses, and possible discounts that we give to some clients. Then we obtain effective gross income. We add the recoveries, which is common expenses that are charged to the tenants. Then we have gross income. We subtract expenses. We add other income, which is possible services that we give to the tenants and represent an additional income for the owners. 
And after all these, we obtain EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. We subtract uh, depreciation, we obtain EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. We subtract taxes, we obtain earning, earnings after taxes. And then we add back depreciation and we subtract CAPEX to obtain the free cash flow, as in any other valuation. So we are we have identified the different components of the uh, of the income statement of an income property. So what we are proposing is to group these components into three categories. The first category that will use the gross yield implied rate R as the discount rate, uh, because all these items of the uh, income statement, all these all these items of the income statement are closely correlated with the rent. For instance, the gross potential income is the rent itself. Losses, losses are directly tied to the rent. Other income depends on also the number of tenants and the rent that we have. And taxes depend fundamentally on the income because expenses are pretty fixed. Then the second category will be discounted at the risk-free rate. This, is, this includes expenses and capex. Basically, because we assume that expenses and capex are relatively stable and are easy to uh, project into the future. And the final category is recoveries, which are the expenses which are charged back to the tenants and are recovered uh, by, by the owners. Well, recoveries depend both on uh, the risk free rate and, uh, I'm sorry, dep depend both on um, the expenses and on the rent. So the risk of recoveries is somewhere in between R and RF. It's somewhere in between the implied uh, discount rate and uh, the, the, um, the risk-free rate. Some comments then, and this is like concluding our previous uh, proposal. Discounting the cash flows uncorrelated with the rent, meaning expenses and capex, at the risk-free rate is justified given that they are mostly expenses and investments that can be estimated with certainty. Well, another possibility to discount these cash flows at the cost of debt, if we, if we assume that you know, the risk is not precisely the uh, risk-free. The absolute present value of these cash flows will be larger than if they were discounted at the implicit gross yield discount rate. Let me explain this. Given that we are going to discount these outflows, which is expenses and capex, we're going to discount these outflows at the risk-free rate, and the risk-free rate is less that the implied discount rate, the gross yield implied discount rate, then the present value in absolute terms will be larger, okay? Because we are discounting at a lower rate. So the present value of this of these uh, cash flows will be larger than, than otherwise, than the present value that we will have if we discount at the, at the gross yield implied rate. As we said before, in, in, uh, relating regarding the recoveries, well, as long as recoveries are not very important, their magnitude is not very relevant, then it doesn't make a lot of difference at what rate we discount them. Um, a possible solution is just to assume some, some rate in between R and RF, some average between the two. Uh, in the end, uh, if again, if the magnitude is not very important, this will not make a big of difference. Well, the final effect it will be a smaller present value than the one obtained if the free cash flows were discounted at the implicit gross yield rate. Again, why? Because we are discounting all the outflows at a lower rate, so the present value of the outflows will be bigger. So the net present value that we obtain will be smaller. So under the proposed approach, the net present value of the pro property will be smaller than the net present value that we would obtain if we discount uh, the free cash flows at the gross yield implied rate as is usually done. Let's look at an example. Here we have um, a pro forma income statement of a property uh, for the next five years. And we have, you know, uh, it is expressed in the same form that we uh, described before. And let's assume the following parameters. We are assuming a gross yield of 12%, a growth rate of 3%. In consequence, the gross yield implied rate will be the sum. Remember that the gross yield implied rate R will be Y plus G. So it will be 
and the risk-free rate will be 5%. So the, what we are going to do now is we are going to calculate the net present value of the property with both methods, the proposed method and the traditional approach. The first thing that we do is that we copy the gross yield implied flows in these rows. So the gross yield implied flows are the gross potential income, losses, other income, and taxes. We add them up, and the result is the gross yield cash flow. It's the cash flow that we will discount at the gross yield implied discount rate. Second, we obtain the risk-free cash flow. How do we obtain the risk-free cash flow? Well, the risk-free cash flow will be the result of subtracting total grease, total, uh, the total gross yield cash flow from the free cash flow. So, for instance, uh, the risk-free cash flow in year one will be 506 minus 741. The risk-free cash flow in year two will be 558 minus 816, and so on. The risk-free cash flow is negative because it is just an outflow. It includes expenses and investments. So let's do the calculations. If we follow the proposed approach, we discount the gross yield cash flow, the gross yield cash flow, using the um, the implied discount rate, the gross yield implied discount rate, and we obtain this result, 2,919. Then we discount the risk-free cash flow at the risk-free rate, and we obtain minus 1,270. So the net result will be the net present value of the property, 1,713. If we do this by the traditional approach, we simply would discount the free cash flow. So we would discount this free cash flow at the gross yield implied rate R. If we do that, simply that, as it is usually done by practitioners, we obtain a, a result of 1,999. As I said before, uh, we obtained a lower value under the proposed method than under the traditional approach. We obtained 1,713 under our proposal versus 1,999 under the traditional approach. So let's conclude. The traditional approach for valuing income properties discounts free cash flows with the gross yield implied discount rate. We are that this method is incompatible with the risks associated with the different cash flow streams that compose the free cash flow. An alternative procedure has been proposed that discount, discounts each cash flow category at this corresponding discount rate. And this is all I wanted to share with you in this opportunity. Thank you.